It's very difficult actually to mention one particular memory or memories because memory is very funny, you know. They very much depend on the state in which one is in the present day, the mood in which one is, the attitude towards life, the experiences one has. So out of the cluster of memories, a particular memory emerges. One memory which persists and which was not spectacular in any way, but which first was the first instance in which I got a taste in a very elementary and a very basic way that we lived in times which are very frightening and uncertain. I couldn't formulate these clearly, but it was enough for me. I was in Mahmudabad in the Qila. I was walking down one of the lanes in the parallel to my garden. And my mentor, known in Urdu as Ataliq, Mr. Murtaza Hussain, he was with me. And suddenly someone came to him and said something in his ear, one of the servants. And I knew him quite well. I used to spend a great deal of time. And he stopped. And he crouched on the ground, which he very rarely did when he was walking. And I said, what is the matter? And he said, Gandhi ji ko qatl kar diya gaya. Qatl ke maane to mein samajhta ke maar daale gaya. Aur unke chehre se mujhe ye andaza hua that this was something that had very deep resonances. I mean, it was something very serious. So this is one of the first, one of the very earliest of memories. Considering I was only four years old. There were memories of the Qila, of how it was, and uh, how my father had tried, because he spent very little time, so he had tried to um, make a, create a, a kind of atmosphere in the Qila which would expose me to something that I would not be otherwise exposed to. If I, had I been li living in a city, I would have seen many such things. So he made a little zoo for me. And he would ask his retainers to take me to see. I was not allowed to ride, but just to see when the horses, uh, the our, the people who uh, are very small cavalry, if I can call it, or horse guards, which would be much better, horse guards, they exercises their horses and so on. It was an outing for me. The many other memories uh, are the memory of uh, going to Iraq on a ship from Bombay. There were two ships that operated, Dara and Damra. And I cannot now remember, I think it was Dara, 
on which I first set foot. And we went down the Gulf and up to Basra. And when we were passing what is now the Sultanate of Oman, large numbers of pearl drive divers would come and dive for pearls and bring out pearls. They were memories of uh, my own um, governess. Apart from my mentor, I had a governess. And the, it was uh, uh, a, very, a somewhat uneasy arrangement between them because one was totally Anglo-Indian, that is the governess, and one was pure Urdu, one symbolized pure Urdu culture, Persian culture, Awad, the culture of Awad and the Mughals. When we speak of Awad, I remember my mentor telling me that we never acknowledge the fact that Awad, the Awadi culture transformed the culture that they actually came with. That culture was Mughal culture. That they took to a different stage. That is a different matter. But it was the foundations of the best Mughal culture formed the foundations of Awad culture. And this was my mentor used to tell me. So you see, from a, from the child, you see this, the assassination and martyrdom of Gandhi, the journey to Karbala again martyrdom. I mean, not you see, I'm speaking, but they all connected in a sense. How that this world is full of people. Who die for right causes. I couldn't understand fully because life, I thought, was very, very wonderful, you know, precious, whatever it was. And I could not imagine how people would voluntarily die for it or involuntarily or anticipate it. The other thing was the fact that in all the conversations with my mentor, not with my governess, who only saw to it that I had some rudimentary understanding of English, and that I had a disciplined life, because the concept was that the, in quotes, and I'm only quoting, that people who were connected with Western culture were more disciplined in their lives than the Easterners. So a modicum of that had to be imparted to me so that I could also have a disciplined life. It was very early, but there it was. But one thing in what my mentor used to say, stay, uh, say to me was how it, they were not stories he told me. It was always with a purpose in mind. And often that purpose was to show how um, this great civilization of the Mughals, this culture, this great civilization, this the Tehzeeb, as you call it, uh, which then came to Avad, how it collapsed and why it collapsed. And he couldn't convey it to a child, but he tried. Out of this later, I joined the dots and said that the Mughals were actually underplayed in Awadh deliberately because there was a policy in, of the British to diminish any symbol or any person who symbolized the unity of greater India. And to show that India was a conglomerate, that was later. So the memories persist, and that 
memory now comes later and leads to thoughts, leads to ideas, leads to... And I thought that that is what he was trying to say to me. That the reason is that they wanted to show that they were disparate groups, that India is not a nation. In, in the, it is, maybe he was, maybe they were right or maybe they were wrong. I'm not going to argue about that because the concept of nation is a very modern one. But that unity of India, forget the nation, that unity, they wish to destroy it for their own reasons. So Tipu Sahab, when he talked about Tipu Sultan or Hyder Ali, it was with the same passion with which he talked about Malka Hazrat Mehr. And Maulana uh, uh, now you see the name has gone from my mind in the 1857 uh, 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 uprising uh, one of them of course was uh, uh, from Kharabad uh, the Fazlul uh, Haq Fazl e Haq Maulana Fazl e Haq Kharabadi a remarkable man he and Savarkar were together for a while, only for a short while. And I'm not even sure whether they overlapped so much. I don't think they did. No, no, no. no. And I think of it. Fazle Kharabadi was a little earlier, but he lived in the Andaman Islands after 1857 for a, quite a significant period. He was given many opportunities to express his regret, offer apologies, and then he was assured that his sentence would be commuted. Kharabadi, Maulana Fazlah Kharabadi never relented. This is one of the stories from the past which my mentor. Mr. Murtaza Hussain, known as Lallan Sahib, used to tell me. Now, at that time, this made not such a deep impression. They were just facts which I collected, sometimes facts which disturbed me, but not a lot because children have a different. But I must confess that he, his influence, my mother's influence, and my father's. Somehow, and the manner in which I lived, I lived a very lonely life, I must tell you. I was not allowed to meet people, children outside. I uh, had really, when I come to think of it, really no one to play with. Or hardly anyone. So that was a... Uh, I wanted to play, but then I reconciled myself, I suppose. People do, children. So that shaped me somehow. So whatever I am today, these are the inputs. These are the things that I remember as shaping me. And that is very important for me. Because I try and introspect and see so many things about myself. This is one of the things. And so, uh, I mean, I became a kind of uh, somewhat um, not morose, but not a very cheerful boy. I think that what you just mentioned, uh, you know, everybody just assumes that uh, being royalty must make things easy for people. So, uh, what's it like being uh, royalty? I mean, there's also you see, obviously, some, uh, obviously some things that are also very difficult. Uh, so could you, so could you see, that? one of the things, you see, I would like to say something here about your question. As a child and subsequently, 
one of the words that never occurred in our conversations, be it with my mentor, who was very close to me, obviously, be my mother, it may, may be it my mother, my father, other members of my family, the word royal never, ever was mentioned or uttered. If the word Riyasat was mentioned, and if the word Raja was mentioned, of course it was, there was always a little comment which somehow was also made to me that this is the most superficial, the most transient, the most perhaps uh, Unimportant. I, I, I'm hesitating and saying I can't find the word, but uh, aspect of what our family is. The emphasis was not on that. In fact, it was away from it. So that as a child, I am the only child. Maybe one cousin of mine. My father's younger brother's youngest son. But times had changed a lot. He was born in 48, I think, or 49. So this is independence. You know. I was born before independence. There are no pictures of me. There were, I, I was, no photographs were taken of me. My mother had a superstition, so no, there, were, there were no photographs of me as a child. Her brother died. Lots of photographs were taken of her. Somehow her mind connected. Her mind is strange. And uh, there are no photographs until I was 16. But I can assure you that I was I would never permitted to wear anything that I would call was royal tinsel. And sorry, to, I don't mean to be uh, dismissive, or I don't wish to sound superior, but actually, I, so my what were the clothes I wore? The clothes I wore as a child were cotton. Sometimes they were garha, they were called gara, very similar to Khadr. I never actually wore anything that was spun by my mother or my sisters on the jarakha. But I believe some cloth was made of it. My father also used the charcha, the Ambar charcha. And when he went to Iraq, this is just an aside because I will forget about it, he took the Ambar charcha. Of course, there was no occasion to use it there because cotton, uh, you know, the whole thing couldn't be done. It's just something. It, it was there. I saw it. It was in a huge box. And I saw it. One day he assembled it. To some of his friends in Iraq and should. So I used to wear gara. I always wear gara. And my mother uh, would see to it that I wore coarse clothes. Never wore anything silken. Never wore anything with gold in it or silver. And one of the earliest memories, of, which again I have, you see, is when in 1947, uh, on the 14th of August, we were in Zahedan. We left India, 
British India on the 13th of August. To be in, uh, from Quetta, Zahidan, to go to Zahidan. And uh, our retinue, the entire retinue, went in buses and cars from Quetta into Irani Baluchistan and then to the capital Zahedan, where the governor general was. And we stayed uh, with, with the governor general. Uh, well, we then went to Tehran. I have vague memories of it. But one thing which I heard being mentioned at that time and made a deep impression on me because I remembered it all is that uh, the king of Iran invited my father for uh, a lunch or dinner, dinner with a, a banquet. So my father very discreetly and respectfully made it known to him that he would not eat with any implements that had gold or silver and that he apologized for it because he knew that banquets often had cutlery or even plates which were made of silver or gold. So the Shah, you know, to his credit at that time, I had only China. I was told I didn't, of course, go. I mean, these are the things which were actually the inputs in my life. Other members of my family wore silk and heaven knows all kinds of this embroidered stuff. And you have Zardozi and with pearls and special stones and so on. I never even wanted to. This is an interesting thing. I never wanted to. That's something I can't explain. I've often thought of it. I never asked my mother or my father ever if I could. The only thing I asked him whether I could wear was an abba that was given by uh, Ibn Saud to me when we went for Hajj. He gave the Hazami Kaaba, which is a very large piece, in fact, one side of the Kaaba, with an eye which is still in the Qila. And he gave my father's gifts and my mother, and he gave me an Abba and a watch. A watch was not that interesting. Right? The Abba was, because it had gold in it, and it was like a Maulana's Abba, but more beautiful. My father said, no, no, I don't think you should wear it. I never did, and my mother likewise. So I, I accepted it. I said, I won't wear it. I won't wear it. I accepted it. And uh, so this is, you see, uh, in terms of... Uh, food in terms my governess, I ate with my governess. Then I had my own uh, little table after my governess. I separated from my governess. That was in 1947 uh, when we went to, as I mentioned, to uh, She didn't accompany us. And then she, um, she, her services were not required, so she was, didn't come back, and my mentor took over. So I had my own little table uh, in my mother in my mother's quarters, where I would eat by myself. And I remember that arhar ki dal ka mujhe shauk tha thora sa, aur sade salan ka. Sade salan pakka tha. अरहर की दाल नहीं पक्की थी तो मैंने कहा अरहर की दाल और दाल कोई और थी शायद मसूर की थी ओ इट वाज ब्लैक मसूर इट वाज येलो मसूर आई कांट रिमेम्बर बट इट वाज नॉट अरहर सो आई सेड 
to the ladies who were attending me that uh, wouldn't it be nice if I could have a I heard that. And it was lunch, you know, so it couldn't be cooked, you see. So one of them said, we'll go to your aunt's quarters, your puppy's quarters. And they always have arhar ki dal for lunch, invariably. Let us go and ask. My mother stopped them in their tracks and said, he, you will have whatever has been laid before you. So that was another lesson, which I remember now. <laughs> she was very loving, but she never expressed her love openly. She was very distant openly, but very affectionate, but very distant, and somewhat hard. Always concerned about my education. So much so that Maulana. Uh, I must write this down, you know, because the, these memories will otherwise go. Maybe it's the heat, maybe something else. He used to teach Elahiyat. I, his, I, his name will come back to me. He used to teach Elahiyat, which means um, theosophy, not in the modern sense of the, theosophy, but the knowledge of the. the not, about God. And he was a remarkable man. Remarkable man. He was, uh, didn't wear a kaba and abba and so on. And he used to come to teach me. Uh, I, I've, I, I'll remember his name, and if I don't, I'll try and slip it in somehow in your, in an edited version. You, you can remove this bit. You can. Uh, he was regarded very highly by the people of Lucknow. Many ulama studied under him. And nothing could be better for me than this person. He was a gentle person who cared for children, very old, quite old. And uh, Dressed in an angarka or a white achka, chui dal, pajamas, no pajamas. He had a great sense of humor, so he used to laugh a lot and he used to teach me as, as a, in a kind of modern way of making the entire thing not a lesson, but partly play and partly of a certain level and partly academic. My mother heard of this, that he laughs a lot and is not strict with me. To my great misfortune, my mother asked the ulama who had appointed him to kindly ask him to leave. And a gentleman called Maulana Saadat Hussain Saab was appointed who was also very loving, but outwardly was very intimidating. I mean, if a child saw him, he would freeze in his tracks. And he was also the Mahom. He was very well known here. One Anasad and Susan, he was very highly regarded. He was the uh, initial men teacher, mentor of Agar Uvisab. And me, both of us. But his way of teaching was different. It was the traditional method. No punishments because they thought I was perhaps delicate or would get too frightened or something. I, I, I would. I would have because once or twice I cried him and they realized that nothing had happened. But I anticipated something. And cried. So they realized that this chap is not, is not, he, 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 there's a way of dealing him, just a bit of pressure. So this is, the, this is how the house was then. And then I, I went abroad, which was a huge uh, 
discontinuity in my life, to use a, a mathematical phrase. A discontinuity which was so spectacular that it, it really made me realize how I had completely missed out on other worlds. I had not been taken to England or anything as a child. I spent two years or three years in Iraq, three years actually, in a Irani madrasa, which was not a madrasa, it was a school. It was called a madrasa, but it was a modern school which taught modern subjects and Farsi and Arabic and a bit of, sorry? This was between the ages of seven and a half and ten. And the first time I saw um, uh, a dis or read about a, a discussion in Arabic of a Stone Age people and pictures of them, it was a modern school. Uh, and so obviously, you know, there was no fable. No, of course, they had a very good curriculum. My father had initially thought that I would study there and then go to this Jesuit college in uh, Baghdad or maybe go to the university in Beirut or something. But then he changed his mind and I came back here and went to La Martinia for a while and then went from here to England. Even while I was in La Martinia, I was never allowed to go to people's house, friends' house. Never. Ex um, no, they were never prevented from coming here. But the house had an aura which was a bit intimidating. I don't think children like that. You know. Other children. And they're not that understanding, and quite rightly so. I mean, why on earth? Should a child accept, you know, this kind of setup? You know, I mean, it's not very nice. So perhaps rumor went around something, but there was one person to who, whose house I was allowed, and it was extraordinary. And his name, he later became an IS officer, Aditya Kumar Rastogi, also known as Vicky Rastogi who then rose to be Principal Home Secretary, DM of Lucknow, Principal Home Secretary. And he was, he's, a, he's still alive, he's a wonderful person. I went to his house, and I was very surprised that I was allowed to go to his house. His father was the su chief superintendent of jails. That shook me slightly that I was going to the house of the chief superintendent of jails. It was my friend's house, but I, nevertheless, it was his house. And I had my first truly vegetarian meal and came home and boasted about it. I said, today I have had a meal which had no meat in it, and it was really delicious. We used to have pulkas when we were unwell. I had pulkas at this dinner when I went to this friend's house at Vicky Rastogi's house. His sisters were there, and I was there, and it was a wonderful experience. So you see, it was one experience, and I, you know, it's amazing. I, I knew a lot of boys there, and they were very nice to me. My mentor used to go to school, to La Martina, in the car, the car would wait for me the whole day. He would take out a carpet and sit. It was beautiful in those days in the winter. And of course, in the monsoons, he had to sit in the car. But uh, in winter, and, and obviously in the summer, the school was in recess. But uh, he would take out his carpet, he'd sit there. My food would come from home in a tiffin carrier. And I sat and ate on the carpet with him, on the grounds of La Martinia. Once or twice I tried to invite people, 
and uh, they politely refused very nicely i cannot remember anyone i cannot remember anyone who actually sort of showed any great desire to see what the food from Mehmudabad house was like. They used to play marbles, uh, and the other thing, you see, it's amazing. It, it, so it, it gives you some insight. Um, we were not permitted to wear black shoes. I think uh, uh, there are people here One of my very dear friends, Nawab Hussain Afsar Sahib, who will be able to tell you why black shoes were not allowed. Two colors were not allowed. Black shoes and green shoes. Any other color was fine. So I had to get a special dispensation from the principal to wear brown shoes. Now, I wore brown shoes, and you can imagine how boys are. I was marked for that. I used to have two earrings in my ears. My ears were pierced. And one had a ruby on the left. And the right had an emerald. The emerald was lost on the Dakota Plain while we were flying from Zahedan. It was a dreadful flight from Zahedan, from Quetta to Zahedan, before partition. Before partition. And I didn't know what I did, but it fell and nobody found it. And, and then they didn't replace it. But the ruby was left. And it was, uh, I used to turn it round so that. Only the wire was visible. And boys, being what they are, would come up to me and quietly say to me, Larka hai larka. Now that was not very nice. You know. And uh, one thing which I somewhat regret in, in retrospect, if I look back on things, so I was not allowed to play games. And they gave me a dispensation not to play games. But, you know, they had other something, reading or something. For me. Mr. Dutre was the principal. It was not done normally. I was the only exception. That didn't mark me, by the way. I mean, I never felt, I never got a complex as a result. I didn't like the question, but that was, I knew that once or twice it happened, then I took it as a I've not answered the question. How were the teachers the teachers? They were very nice, wonderful to me. Uh, they were very, very good. They, as they treated me as any other student. Uh, Vicky Rastogi and I uh, were pretty good in Latin. And uh, Dickie remembers these incidents. He was, he was very bright, you know. He was very good in Latin. And I was also pretty good in Latin. And uh, one of the reasons was that a man called Rodriguez used to teach Latin, who had a terrible temper. And uh, only once, when for some reason I had not done my homework, and had not even revised for the thing. I used to wear glasses, and he called me. He used to cane people in those days. But he, and he was very hard on most students. So he called me and said, what is the meaning of this? And of course, I had no answer. So he said, Step forth, laddie. That's how you spoke. Laddie was his wit. 
And so I stepped forth. Take off your glasses, laddie. And I took off my glasses and howled. But that didn't help. I got one huge slap on my face for not having done my homework. Because he said, you're very good and you just have been lazy like most people are in the city. Such was the attitude. Never forgot that. I, I didn't weep because of the slap. It was the humiliation. That, that little phrase, take off your glasses, laddie, that was as if I had been disgraced beyond redemption. And how did your family react to this? My mother was very happy. She was happy? Yes. Because uh, someone used to come teach me uh, here. Just to help me with the, some English and so on. And uh, the lessons would go very well. My mother would pass by and twist one of my ears and even hit me, not so gently, on my shoulder or back or something. And say to the teacher in English, you're not hard enough. Meaning, I am now fulfilling what you should do. So that is how she was. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's an unusual thing. I, I saw a lot of my father initially as a child. But then he went, when we went to Iraq, he stayed on. He stayed on in Iraq. We were Indians. We continued to be Indians. And he continued to be an Indian until 1957. And in 1957, his friend said to him that things were very bad in Iraq. And especially his political friends. Two in particular whom he mentioned. Kamil Chadarchi. Kamil, or maybe Chadarchi was the name. He was prime minister. He, he was not then prime minister, but he had been prime minister. And Majid Mustafa Baraz, from the Barazani tribe. Uh, he had been viceroy of the Turks in the Ayalatul Iraq, Basra, Wal Iraq. Musa al Basra, all this was under him. Also, I think even parts of Syria. So, anyway, that, they said to him that he should leave that things were brewing in Iraq. And he left. The next year, there was this huge coup which overthrew the king. Then I saw my father once a year or something. And we used to go to Calcutta to train my mother and I. And uh, um, you know, the, there was a great deal of um, great emphasis on religion in both the Hindu household and the Muslim household. And uh, a large number of people, even from Mahmudabad, would never eat in our house anything. Our family, likewise, for a long time, never ate in a non-Muslim house. Maybe a Christian house, but with ifs and buts. Now that's very interesting. I see greater hatred now between communities when they eat with each other. And I did not see that, or remember it, or felt it as a child when I moved around in school, or even when I used to visit India, never felt it. And people were very religious. I mean, there is a person in Mahmudabad who's still alive. He has a great affection for me. He is from amongst the Mahmudabadis. I mean, people of, from 
our place. And when he comes, and whenever he came, he would come and you, I, I always offered him uh, a fruit, or a fruit, a banana, or an orange, not peeled. And he would take it in his hand, not refuse it. And the moment he was outside our gates, he would give it away. Yet his love and commitment to us is greater than the commitment of many Muslims. Now, isn't that interesting? So, I think it, what happened was that without our feeling this, and certainly my feeling it, there was a great transformation that was taking place. And transformations aren't seen. They're not like earthquakes. They're very gradual. It's like the desert creeping and creeping and creeping until it overtakes the land around it. This is what is said about deserts. And so, in terms of the transformations that were taking place, there was sociological, economic, and political transformation. And we didn't realize what was happening. And in that, forces were being actually engendered, created, which would have repercussions then and which had ramifications for the future. And which we see now. What went wrong, I don't know. It's difficult for me to say. Because perhaps democracy as it is in India, it's something which in itself changes, has changed the social fabric. So what we eat, how we eat it, what we say to people, all affected. And I find it very amusing now, you know, we have so much, you see, we are one and there is no difference and so on. I never had, we never had to say this. Do you say this to your family? Does anyone say it to your family? To father and mother? Oh, mother and father, we are one. No, we are one family. I think if somebody says that, then there's something wrong. Either there is a conflict in the family, or there is an underlying conflict, or there is some suspicion, or there is some doubt. Husband and wife, they say it to, to each other, but certain family, I mean, you never actually declare to the world the fact that you're a united family. Is it? I don't know. This is how I feel. So for me, expressing something itself means that there's something wrong. Therefore, you have to say. It's not that spontaneous reaction, that spontaneous love that comes out. And, and, and one of the things which I would as, say to you before, I mean, I've been going on and you should ask me some questions, I suppose, is because is religion played a very, very major part in our lives, my, certainly my life and my family's life. Religion in terms not so much of superstition, which there was uh, amongst the ladies a certain amount, but uh, constant scrutiny of what was being done, happening outside, what was being done with the framework and instruments of what was uh, known as Islamic thought or Islamic sharia, not sharia so much as Islamic thought and history. So it was crew with. That it was scrutinized with that in mind. And I, that's a very, very vivid kind of thing that comes back to me. And uh, I've seen 
Lucknow, part of it has, of course, now improved. It's wonderful now. 